I've been thinking about this uh, quite a bit actually recently in my life about how oftentimes whenever I face anything, any kind of hardship, any kind of struggle or challenge, whether it be here at the church or, or uh, in, in my personal life, whatever it is, I've been thinking about how I ought, my default, automatically I think to myself, this uh, problem, this challenge is creating the problems I have in my life. And what I'm learning is that actually oftentimes the challenges, the struggles, the weaknesses in my life, those are the places that are just exposing where I need God to lead me. They're just the places, the sites of my life where God's trying to expose, hey, you need me in this. You need me right here. So uh, oftentimes I'll example... Um, I have these periods of time where I'll get on social media and I'll be on social media and I'll be active and then I will get off social media and like I can't be on social media anymore. It's horrible. And what will happen is uh, I'm getting on social media and I'm looking and I will find some guy about the same age as me that I know and he's got kids the same age as my kids and he's got a job and he's busy and works but he is shredded. <laughs> And I will look, and I'm just like, how can somebody, how can that happen? And so I'll get all insecure, or I'll get envious, or whatever, and then I will decide, you know what? Social media is causing my problems. It's causing all these problems of insecurity in my life. But what? And then I will get off uh, Facebook for a little while, or, or Instagram, or whatever it is for a bit. But what if, what, what if social media isn't actually creating my problems? What if social media is just exposing the insecurity that's always been there, Right? The envy that's always been there. I was talking to someone this past week, having struggles in their marriage, and they are convinced, this person is convinced, my bad marriage has caused all my problems. This is my spouse's fault. I had no problems before I got married, and so they're, they're in their mind, they are convinced, my bad marriage caused all my problems. Your bad marriage didn't cause your problems. Your, your bad marriage is simply exposing your real problem. That you are a selfish sinner, just like me, just like all the rest of us, and you need God. On a more uh, personal, even note, uh, every six months, I go through this kind of journey with fear. I, I go through uh, uh, full body CT scans every six months uh, to determine whether or not I'm still in remission. And so I just went through another round of that, and, and praise God, I mean, it was good news. I, I am still in remission, and I'm thanking God for that. But, yeah. And, I, I, you know, I don't talk about it to the people who are close to me very much. I don't share about it a lot when I'm going through that. But every time, it's like this journey with fear. Fear comes up in my life. And so the question is, did, did a, a cancer diagnosis, did it create fear in my life? Or really, is it just that a cancer diagnosis is exposing the fear that's always been there? underneath everything in my life. I need God in those places. The, the longer you follow Christ, the more you realize the struggles, the brokenness, the wounds, the challenges, the problems that you face, they didn't create your situation. They are exposing the very places where you need God to lead you. Those are the places where you need to invite him in. And oftentimes we don't. We say, I got to get that out of the way. That's interfering with me being a good person or me being, you know, doing all the things I should be doing. God doesn't want us to, he wants us simply to look at those places in our life and say, oh, Jesus, we need you. We need you. The question I want to ask you as you reflect today is, where is he exposing your need to be led by him? Where is God exposing that you have a need to be led by him? Here's a hint. It's probably a place of, a place of pain. It's a place of uncertainty. It's a place of fear, anxiety, worry. It's a place of anger, blame, unforgiveness. What he's doing is he's exposing. He's bringing it to your attention. He's helping you see this is a place in your life where you need me. You need, you need me to lead you because you don't have what it takes in your own power. This is the way the Israelites operated in the wilderness. God, we don't move until we see you move. We need you to lead us. Now, there's no cloud today. I know what some of you are thinking, well, that's awesome. You know, we don't have like a cloud that lifts today and it's, it's not that easy, right? Today, well, we, that's true. We do not have a cloud today, but we have a wind. That's what we have. The Holy Spirit. 
And actually, a, a dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit is something that Jesus wanted for us. He desperately wanted us to experience that as his followers. So this is uh, John chapter 14. On the last night that Jesus was, was with his disciples, before he was betrayed and went to the cross, he makes them a promise. This is what he says, verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and does not recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now. So he's talking about himself. He lives with you now, and later he will be in you. Now, uh, what's interesting in the original language there is uh, where Jesus says, I, I will ask the Father and he will send another advocate. Like in our English language, we get kind of an idea in our head, well, it's a different person and another advocate means, so, but an, the word another there actually in the original language meant another one the same as me. Not another one different than me. Jesus is literally saying the same, the same uh, God who is with you right now will be in you by the power of the Holy Spirit Another advocate the same as me. This is what Jesus wanted for his disciples. So if you know Jesus, you know the Holy Spirit already. If you've come to a place in your life where you've entrusted your life to, to Jesus, where you've repented and you've said, God, I can't run my life in my own power. It's nothing but, but brokenness and it's nothing but sin. I surrender my life to you. I invite you to be Lord of my life. If you've come to that place in your life, you already know the Holy Spirit He's already actively at work in your life. He's already actively speaking to you. You already know him. But maybe you're not experiencing him every single day. What's interesting is that Jesus, in the very beginning of the book of Acts, he says to his disciples, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to go into an upper room and I want you to wait. He literally says, like, you do not have yet what you need to start the church. Do not try to start the church yet in your own power. That's what he tells them to do. I, I find it amazing that Jesus says, like, until you have the Holy Spirit, you don't have what you need to start the church. The disciples who had been with Jesus day in, day out for three years did not have what they needed still to start the church. They, they'd seen Jesus raised from the grave. They'd spent 40 days with the resurrected Christ. They still did not have what they needed to start the church. Jesus is like, whatever you do, go in the upper room and wait. Just stop. The only decision they made while they were in the upper room was who was going to replace Judas as the next disciple. And they, they decided that by casting lots, <laughs> which is the way of the world. And then, you know, many of you, you know the beautiful story in Acts chapter 2 is the moment they're in the upper room and the Holy Spirit arrives on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples, and then many others begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And really, the rest of the book of Acts, if you've read the book of Acts, the, the entire rest of that uh, entire book of the Bible, really the main character is the Holy Spirit. It's just about how the Holy Spirit just kept leading the church and leading the disciples and leading people. And, and again, I would submit to you today that's what Jesus wanted for us. That's what he still wants for us. It's what we're still called to today. He wanted for us to have this dynamic, active relationship with the Holy Spirit where we're, lead, we're being led by him, where we're inviting him into the places in our lives where we're struggling, where, where we don't know what to do next, and we're realizing, oh, look, this isn't an opportunity for me to jump in and fix it in my own strength. This is an opportunity for me to step back and say, oh, God, okay, God, you're exposing a place in my life where I need you. Come, Holy Spirit, come and lead me. That's what he wanted us to do. That's the kind of relationship he wanted us to have. Now, maybe you uh, have the Holy Spirit living in you. You have a relationship with Jesus. Go ahead to that next one if you would. But, but the question is, you know, why, aren't, why don't we experience the, the Holy Spirit leading us? Maybe you're wondering right, right now, well, if all this is true, why don't, I, why don't I experience that? Why don't I sense him? And, and here's what I would tell you is that I, I think the reason is because we do not know how to invite and respond to him today. In fact, in the church, I don't think we, we've given enough time to the Holy Spirit. I don't think we've talked enough or taught enough on who the Holy Spirit is and how he wants to have an active part in our lives and leading us and guiding us. We don't know how to invite him in our lives and we don't know how to respond to him, particularly in the West, in the church today. We, we just don't understand that. 
I love this moment going back again into the tabernacle and the story of Israel. Before the tabernacle was finished, Moses and God have this powerful conversation where basically Moses is like, okay, God, I know you called me to lead these people, but who are you going to send with me? Moses is recognizing like, I can't lead these people in the wilderness. And so even before the tabernacle is built, Moses is asking God, who are you going to send? Who are you going to send? I love this conversation. Exodus 33, verse verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. You're going to rest, Moses. It's not going to be you and your own effort doing it. It's going to be me and my presence leading you. Then Moses said to him, I love this line so much. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses literally says back to God, if your presence isn't going to go with me, if if it isn't going to go with us as a people, don't send me up from here. Do you understand what Moses is saying there? He's saying, I I don't want a a messenger. I don't want an angel. I don't want an LED wall. I don't want a, a really great rock and worship band. I don't want a thriving kids ministry. I want your presence. If I don't have your presence, if I, if you're not with me, God, I'm not moving. He is literally refusing to move until he knows that God is leading him by his presence. That's what he's saying. That's what he's doing. Our chief assignment today is to ask for him and then be willing to receive whatever it is he wants to give us. That's what we're called to be today. That's what we're called to do as his people. To invite him into the places of our lives where we need him, into the places of our lives where we don't know what to do, where where something is too big for me. And then be willing to follow, be willing to receive Oftentimes, it's more of a gradual dependence on the Holy Spirit that grows over time as we learn to follow him rather than some big explosion. Now, there are the big explosions, the big moments where he moves dramatically and powerfully. But I've discovered it. Sometimes it's more of just gradually, little by little, day by day, learning when to just go, whoa, I can't act on my own power right now. I need you, Holy Spirit. And we just ask There is no backstage pass to the Holy Spirit. If you know Christ, you have the same access to Jesus. You have the same access to to the Holy Spirit that any of us has. Hey, thanks for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope it made an impact on your life somehow. And if it did, don't forget to like or subscribe or share it on social media with your friends as well. Uh, We always love seeing you. And remember that you can join us live every single Sunday. So hope to see you there.